thanks so much for uh, joining us tonight. Um, on, this is our 100th um, virtual talk. So I want to thank you for, for uh, um, letting me ruin your dinner for all, for all these nights and, uh, and keep coming into your living room. So thank you for all, all for doing that. Um, before we get started, a um, couple things. Uh, as you know, all our talks are brought to you by Cape Cod 5, First Citizens Federal Credit Union and Martha, Vin Martha's Vineyard Savings. And Eight Cousins Bookseller in Falmouth has uh, all the copy has copies of all the books that are on our uh, on our program. So thank you for um, uh, uh, participating with the locals, and I hope you um, go over and get and, and visit them. Uh, our guest tonight, uh, Janice Nemora, um, she went to Yale. She grew up in New York. She's in New York. She's lived in Tokyo. Um, she's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Smithsonian. Um, this is her second book, and um, I want to welcome our guest tonight, Janice Namora. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks for having me, and thanks to all of you for coming in on a lovely evening where it's finally easy to be outdoors and gather. I really appreciate your time. Um, one thing Mark didn't mention because he didn't know is that I spent the first 30 summers of my life on Martha's Vineyard. So Falmouth is a place I've spent some time and I'm really happy to be joining you in a place that's very close to a place that's dear to my heart and actually relevant to this story as you will hear. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, get some pictures while we talk. It's always more fun. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, if you have questions as we go along, please drop them in the chat and we'll, we'll get to them at the end. That's always the best part. So I hope you have some good ones. Um, if you are familiar at all with the name Blackwell, it's probably Elizabeth Blackwell you've heard of and the phrase first woman doctor springs to mind. She was the first woman in this country to receive a medical degree in 1849. And her sister, Emily, there on the right, uh, followed her five years later to become the, sec the third, sorry, in 1854. Together, they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children. And then uh, a few years later, the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary. So I encountered the Blackwell story for the first time ever six years ago. And this was shocking to me. I, uh, as you heard, born and raised in New York, still live here. Um, grew up at a proudly feminist all-girls school from the age of five, uh, was the math science kid at that school, graduated with the intention of pursuing medicine, although I was later seduced by the humanities. Um, how is it that I had never heard of the Blackwell sisters? Even Elizabeth, I had never heard of. How could that be? So once I had stumbled across their story, I wanted to know more. Um, and I discovered fairly quickly that the Blackwell story is not hard to find on the children's biography shelf. Uh, there are many versions of it there, uh, at least the story of Elizabeth. Uh, and these versions all have a lot in common. They all feature illustrations uh, centering on a slim, attractive, well-dressed young woman uh, bending solicitously over a grateful patient and wearing a stethoscope. Uh, this is a chapter book version from the 40s. Um, here is the modern middle grade version in my daughter's school library a long ago. Um, again, nice clothes, grateful patient stethoscope. Here's the picture book version, uh, a slightly younger, perkier version of Elizabeth with cute red bows. Uh, but there's the stethoscope in the bag waiting for her to grow up. Um, it's always Elizabeth, um, never really Emily. So the problem is that the Blackwell sisters looked like this. And in the 1840s and 50s, when they were as young as the women in the illustrations in the picture books, even stethoscopes would have looked like this for the most part. Although the binaural kind had been invented, these were the kinds that most doctors were using still. So it was very clear very quickly that these children's books were incomplete. They were sanitized. All of the contradictions and complexities of these two sisters were sort of polished away in these abbreviated versions. And as I followed the sisters into the archives and started to listen to their voices, it became very clear that these were um, complex, prickly women. Um, and the story itself was not a straightforward Disney princess, feminist icon kind of story. I became really eager 
to reintroduce Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell to the present in all of their complicated glory. So what is their story, briefly? Uh, eight of the nine Blackwell siblings were born in Bristol, England. Uh, they came to this country as children in 1832. They were the sons and daughters of a man who was something of a paradox. He had made his money in the sugar refining industry and spent most of his free time as an ardent abolitionist. Think about that for a second. There's a contradiction there. Um, he gave his five daughters the same gift of education as his four sons. And then on the strength of a dream, he moved them all from Bristol to the New World, to New York, and then all the way out to the edge of civilization, which in 1838 was Cincinnati, in search of a way to make sugar out of sugar beets, which could be farmed in northern climates without enslaved labor. Um, he wanted to find a way to make his industry um, free of, of the taint of slavery. Um, he got them all the way out to Cincinnati, now nine children and his wife, and then he died uh, basically before unpacking and left them with about $20 and a clear lesson for his daughters that a husband is no guarantee of security. None of his five daughters ever married. Um, they did, however, all nine of the children at this point, orphaned at the edge of the universe, um, become a real clan, uh, really bonded to each other, um, really thinking of each other as the most important people in their world. Um, a great gift to the biographer because they all also kind of drove each other nuts. So they were always leaving each other and writing back to each other about each other. Uh, just to give you a taste of what do doing 19th century archival research can look like at the beginning of the 19th century when paper and postage were both quite expensive, um, people did something called cross writing, which is they filled the sheet, then they turned it 90 degrees, and they filled it again. Sometimes they did it again on the back. This is a letter from uh, Henry Blackwell, Elizabeth's little brother in 1844. It's actually an exquisitely clear example of cross writing because Henry had gorgeous handwriting, um, but it is not for everyone, this kind of decoding. I happen to love it, but I know that it's an acquired taste. Um, Elizabeth was born in, nine, in 1821. She just had her 200th birthday on February 3rd of this year. She was the third child and the third girl. Uh, she was voraciously brilliant, uh, socially quite awkward, and blessed with a healthy sense of her own self-worth. She admired the writings of Margaret Fuller, the transcendentalist uh, writer and editor, who right about the time that Elizabeth was a young adult, published a bestseller called Woman in the 19th Century, which would have been a fixture of the Blackwell parlor among their reading material. Um, Margaret Fuller argued in this book that humanity was not going to achieve a higher level of enlightenment until women unleashed their own power and proved what they could do. And what they could do, said Margaret Fuller, had nothing to do with their sex, only to do with talent and effort. Women could be sea captains if they wanted. And Elizabeth, reading this, began to think of herself as someone whose life might prove Margaret Fuller's point and whose life might become a beacon for other women to learn what they might be capable of. As I said, she had a healthy ego. Um, and so Elizabeth Blackwell chose medicine as a way of proving this point. It was an unusual choice for her. She was not someone who loved science or who really wanted to heal the sick. She wasn't all that interested in taking care of people, um, but it was an unusually clear way to prove her point. Medicine was redefining itself both scientifically and institutionally in the middle of the 19th century. Um, hitherto, it had been considered more of a trade, the, a trade of midwives and barber surgeons. Um, now, increasingly, it was a profession, a profession of men who were legitimate by virtue of having earned a medical degree at a medical school. And increasingly, there were medical schools in America. So Elizabeth Blackwell thought if she could find her way into a medical school and attend all the lectures and pass all the examinations, who could argue that she wasn't as qualified as any man to be a doctor? 
She also knew, as this cartoon from the 1820s suggests, that in the eight, still by the 1840s, medical school was not the overwhelming challenge that it is today. Medical school was where you went if you weren't smart enough to study the law. And it consisted in the 1840s still of two identical consecutive 16 week terms of lectures, which you attended one year after the next repeated. Um, if you were lucky, your school had enough um, equipment to show you some dissection. Uh, if you weren't, it didn't. Uh, and you could graduate with a diploma and an alarming degree of ignorance, given that you might never have touched a living patient as part of your education. Elizabeth Blackwell was pretty sure that if she could find her way into a medical school, she would have no trouble finding her way through. Uh, she was, as I said, voraciously brilliant, well-read, very um, enamored of history and philosophy, subjects that really um, were much more of a challenge than what medical school was going to, going to ask her to do. Um, so at the age of 26, Elizabeth Blackwell found her way to tiny rural Geneva Medical College in Geneva, New York, at the tip of Seneca Lake. Uh, she found her way there after a sheaf of rejections from more mainstream and more prestigious medical schools because the very idea of a woman who wanted to be a doctor in 1847 when she was applying was ridiculous. Um, she was either laughed at or, um, or, or recoiled from in horror because being a professional, a doctor as a woman, first of all, was far outside of woman's domestic sphere no proper woman should aspire to be anything more than a teacher, and maybe not even that until after she was married. Um, and also, when you really thought about it, training to be a doctor as a woman entailed sitting in a lecture hall full of men studying the body. What kind of lady would want to do that? It was truly appalling. Um, she was considered something of a freak. Um, her admission to Geneva Medical College was interesting. If you read her memoir, which she wrote 50 years later, it sounds like a foregone conclusion. Finally, I received a letter from Geneva Medical College. I was triumphant. I bought a train ticket and off I went. The reality was a little bit more farcical. What really happened was that uh, Elizabeth sent a letter of inquiry to Geneva Medical College, accompanied by a letter of recommendation from a rather prominent Philadelphia physician who had been mentoring her and allowing her to observe his work and read his medical library. He sent a letter to the faculty at Geneva. The faculty at Geneva, being rather provincial and not particularly prestigious themselves, weren't quite brave enough to reject the recommendation of this Philadelphia physician. So they punted and they said to their students, about a hundred boisterous provincial boys, um, okay, students, we are going to have you vote on whether this woman should join us. And if any one of you decides that she should not, then she won't come. And they figured, okay, we'll be safe. Surely some of them won't want a woman among them. Well, the students recognizing that their professors were being cowards and that this was an opportunity for mischief uh, called a meeting at which they basically bludgeoned into submission anyone who dissented and returned a triumphant yes to the faculty the next day. And then they forgot all about it. The students figured it was probably a practical joke, a prank being played on them by a rival medical school. They forgot about it until three weeks later when Elizabeth Blackwell walked into the lecture hall. Once she was admitted, she quickly won the respect of both the faculty and her classmates because she was operating at a level of determination and motivation and frankly, intellectual power that none of them could match. Um, it became very clear that if you sat next to Elizabeth, your notes would probably end up in better shape. Um, she earned their, the respect of her fellow students and she sort of blew them away. In between terms, remember she had to do two consecutive ones in the summer, she went back to Philadelphia where she went to get some practical experience at Blockley Alms House, which was at this point the largest municipal hospital in America. Remember at this point in the late 1840s, you didn't go to a hospital to get better. People with any money at all called the doctor to their homes. Um, a hospital was not a place for healing. It was basically a warehouse for the destitute. If you were there, it was because you had nowhere else to go. And here, Elizabeth had a crash course all of a sudden in 
um, the connections between poverty and disease, ideas about public health. Her room was off the female syphilis ward, which taught her something about connections between venereal disease and the plight of women. Um, it was the summer of 1848 and waves of refugees were arriving both from Ireland and from continental Europe, bringing with them what was then known as ship fever. Uh, now we call it typhus. Um, so epidemic disease was something that she became aware of when all of these um, typhus sufferers overflowed the beds at Blockley onto pallets on the floor. She ended up writing her thesis on ship fever and it was published as the lead article in the Buffalo Medical Journal when she graduated at the top of her class in January of 1849. Really an extraordinary, not just the first woman doctor, but an extraordinary medical student. Um, unprecedented at every level. So she's got a medical degree and very little practical experience. So Elizabeth does what many medical graduates in America did at this moment in the middle of the 19th century. She went to Europe, which was where the major centers of medical education were, London, Edinburgh, and especially Paris, where the state-sponsored medical education was free and abundant and very progressive and excellent and totally unavailable to her because she refused to dress in drag and pretend to be a man. The whole point of this was to do this as a woman and prove that a woman could do it. As a woman, none of the lectures were available to her. So she found her way here to La Maternité, a municipal maternity hospital in an old convent, which still stands in Paris. I got to explore it a little and take this picture. Um, even though she already had an MD, Elizabeth decided to come here as a student. This was a place where young women from all over France came to train to be midwives. And Elizabeth knew that if she came here as a student and lived in the dormitory, she would have access to a a volume of obstetric cases that would provide invaluable experience. So she did, she came here. And again, if you had any money at all, you would be delivering your baby at home. So this was, again, a place of um, destitute patients, um, often prostitutes, many of them infected with venereal disease. And it was here because of this population that Elizabeth suffered a crisis that changed the shape of her career, if not necessarily its direction. Uh, she was, so if, if a woman who is infected with gonorrhea gives birth, the baby in passing through the birth canal can contract something called gonorrheal conjunctivitis, which is an eye infection. Um, today, not particularly serious, easily treatable with antibiotics, but in 1849, antibiotics had not yet been discovered. Um, Elizabeth was tending to one of these infected infants on the labor ward, early one morning when the liquid that she was using to wash its infected eye splashed into her own face and she contracted gonorrheal conjunctivitis, which again, before antibiotics was a crisis. She was immediately confined to bed in the hospital where she had until a moment before been working. And for weeks she was extremely ill and the fate of her vision hung in the balance. This is a great moment to pause and um, do a little show and tell about what it feels like to write this story um, with many different sources and kind of braid them all together and try to approximate the truth. Um, Elizabeth's colleague, the wonderfully named Hippolyte Blo, was an attending physician at La Maternité. He quickly committed himself to being her physician and shepherding her through this crisis. Um, he was her friend and now he was her doctor. This is how she wrote about it this whole episode in her memoir, again, 50 years later. Ah, how dreadful it was to find the daylight gradually fading as my kind doctor bent over me and removed with an exquisite delicacy of touch the films that had formed over the pupil. I could see him for a moment clearly, but the sight soon vanished and the eye was left in darkness. Sort of sounds like a romance novel, right? And uh, Dr. Blow sort of fulfills the role of leading man quite nicely. Meanwhile, with a different perspective, at the same time and happily for Elizabeth, her eldest sister, Anna, was also in Paris. Um, Anna, as this pose wonderfully suggests, was something of a drama queen, also a journalist, which is why she was in Paris. And she spent her days at Elizabeth's bedside trying to 
help her and soothe her, and her evenings at home writing copious reports back to the Blackwells in Cincinnati on the state of their sister's eye. Um, this is how she wrote about it. The pupil presents just now the appearance of one of those little misshapen blackberries of three granulations and half dried up that one sees so often on some scrubby little bush. If you can fancy one such in dull looking lead, you have just the appearance of this poor eye. Mm, a very different description with almost too much gusto. Um, Elizabeth ends up losing her eye and is fitted for a glass prosthetic, which she wears for the rest of her life and never speaks about. Very few people even know she has a disability, um, but it does redirect her even more strongly in a direction she was already trending um, toward public health, toward ideas about medicine more than the practice itself. Surgery is now closed to her. Um, if you look carefully at this portrait, you can see a slight asymmetry in her gaze. Um, but really it was something that she kept to herself and just made do. Um, she did not, as one might forgive her for doing, she did not go back to America, to Cincinnati, to convalesce after losing one eye. She continued on with her glass eye to London to continue her training at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, another public hospital. And there in London, she made a fateful acquaintance, a young woman named Florence Nightingale. It was now 1851. Florence Nightingale was not yet Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp, the hero of the Crimean War. Um, right now, Florence Nightingale was the daughter of a wealthy family that was very eager to see her married and settled. And she didn't want that. Um, I like to imagine that the advent of Elizabeth Blackwell in London and their um, convergence um, was something of a catalyst for Florence Nightingale. Here's Elizabeth Blackwell. She's got a medical degree. She's left any thought of marriage and family behind in America, and she's roving all over Europe um, getting practical medical experience. She is living proof that Florence Nightingale's dreams of working in nursing in public health are possible. They have this rapturous, instantaneous friendship. They spend a tremendous amount of time together talking about ideas about hygiene, which are quite, quite revolutionary in the current moment in 1851, where people are still not washing their hands between autopsies and labor and delivery. Um, they really have a meeting of the minds. Uh, and then they also discover that there's a bit of a divergence between them, which is that Florence Nightingale really believes that the place of women in health is as nurses, and Elizabeth Blackwell has devoted her life to proving that women can be doctors. They will stay in touch throughout their lives and use each other's ideas, but never quite align on that. Um, the strand of the relationship between Nightingale and Elizabeth Blackwell is an interesting feature of the, of the book that I wrote. Um, okay, so now Elizabeth has finished her European training and she chooses New York as the place where she is going to hang out her shingle and begin her practice at last. And it's going to be wonderful because women are going to flock to her, right, to consult a fellow woman about the embarrassing intimate details of their gynecological illness. Um, she gets to New York and there are no patients. No one comes to her door. Why not? Well, in 1852 in New York, the very phrase female physician does not mean bright woman with a med medical degree. It means someone like Madame Restel, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist, um, caricatured here in the National Police Gazette as a baby eating demon. Um, a female physician was someone who worked on the wrong side of the law, in the shadows. Um, a nice middle-class matron was not going to consult one, at least not openly. Um, no one came and Elizabeth found herself becalmed suddenly, uh, not sure where to turn next. Meanwhile, one thing she could do was that she anointed her sister Emily, five years younger, and the most brilliant of her sisters to follow her into medicine. Uh, she knew that this was going to be a lonely and difficult path and she wanted company. She thought more highly of her own Blackwell clan than anyone else. So Emily was the one that she chose. And Emily was a good choice. Emily was actually naturally drawn to natural science, much more so than Elizabeth had been. And she was used to doing what her three older sisters told her. So she said, okay, this sounds like a challenge that I could rise to, I'll do it. 
Did she have an easier time getting into medical school since her sister Elizabeth had already proved it was possible? No. Um, but even Geneva College barred its door against her saying, uh, thanks, one woman doctor was enough. We've, we've, we've experimented with that. We don't need any more of you. Um, to make things more difficult, in the intervening years, women's medical colleges had begun to open in Boston and Philadelphia, but Elizabeth and Emily saw them as mediocre and inferior. Um, Emily did not want to go to a woman's medical college, so she persevered and eventually, after even more difficulty than Elizabeth had had, uh, received her degree from Cleveland Medical College, which is now Case Western, in 1854. And then she too went to Europe um, to get some practical experience. She went to Edinburgh and she attached herself to the practice of James Young Simpson, one of the most prominent physicians in Britain at the time, a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Edinburgh, by appointment to the queen. Um, he was the man who in 1847 had discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform. It was said that he had discovered them by passing a decanter full of chloroform around at his dinner table, whereupon all of his guests inhaled, burst into hysterical laughter and passed out under the table. He was a bit of a showman, and I like to think that he enjoyed the shock value of having a female MD among his assistants. Um, but at the same time, he taught her a great deal at the leading edge of his specialty. Um, he taught her the use of instruments like these, a pessary, which would have been inserted into the cervix in cases of uterine prolapse, the result of too many pregnancies. Um, he invented an instrument down below called Simpson's Uterine Sound, a sort of a graduated probe used to measure the dimensions of the cervix. Um, Emily is learning how to use these and she is writing fiercely back to New York to try and teach Elizabeth everything that she's learning. Elizabeth with not enough to do right now is learning from Emily. Emily is sketching those two instruments you just saw in the side of this letter. There's the pessary and the sound uh, and describing their use. The roles are a little bit reversed. Um, from the beginning, I wanted this book to be the story of both sisters, not just Elizabeth Blackwell, first woman doctor, but Elizabeth and Emily, because I don't believe you can tell the story of Elizabeth without Emily. Um, however, it's a little bit troublesome because there is more material about Elizabeth. She wrote more, more was written about her, um, more was saved because she was the first and more famous. Um, what do you do when you are trying to make a double portrait and there's just not as much material about one of your subjects? Well, one of the things you can do is get out of the archive and start following your subjects around and try to learn with all your five senses how they felt about what they were doing um, and what it felt like to do it. So I went to Edinburgh. This was one of the best parts of my research. And I followed in the footsteps everything Emily described. Um, here's 52 Queen Street, which was Simpson's residence where he had his consulting rooms and where Emily would have come every day. Um, on the day I walked by, the door was open. So in the spirit of following in the footsteps, I walked in. Um, it's a drug counseling center now, so I wasn't exactly trespassing. Um, but I was able to wander around on that first floor for a little while and get a sense of what it felt like to work there every day before someone asked me to wander out again. Um, but you get to see details like this banister going up to the consulting rooms on the second floor with James Young Simpson's Latinized initials worked into the banister. Um, you get both a sense of what where Emily walked each day and you get a sense of Simpson because what kind of guy puts his initials in his own banister. Um, I also went to the Royal College of Surgeons um, History of Medicine Museum, which is wonderful. I totally recommend it if you are find yourself in Edinburgh in the future. Um, they wouldn't let me take photos, but this is my sketchbook. Lots of artifacts, like the one in the middle there on the left, um, Simpson's pocket pill case that would have been taken on house calls in his, in, in his uh, overcoat, uh, which says, please return to 52 Queen Street under the lid, and was full of horrifying medications like mercury and laudanum, opium, um, things that didn't do a whole lot of good, but that were powerful um, and, and had effects that, that, that patients could see. Um, down below his monaural stethoscopes in ivory and rosewood, I wanted to believe that maybe Emily had even used one of those on his patients. Um, 
Emily is really learning to be a doctor in Edinburgh, a very good one. Um, of course, it's not quite enough to protect her from the same kind of snark that Elizabeth suffered from as well when she braved this barrier. Um, this is a caricature from the London satiric newspaper Punch from 1856, meant to show Emily in the outrageous, appalling bloomer costume of the women's rights movement, something that Emily decidedly did not align herself with, but that's part of another story. Um, here's Emily in bloomers with a ridiculous hat and a rather mannish profile, squinting through spectacles at the only patient who would consult a female physician, a lapdog, um, the lapdog being clutched in the arms of a much more conventionally feminine maiden in hoop skirts. Um, luckily, both Elizabeth and Emily were very good at ignoring this kind of silliness. Emily finishes her training and finally joins Elizabeth in New York. And together in 1857, they found the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children in a building that still stands in Greenwich Village on the corner of Bleecker and Crosby, as it was and as it is, as you can see. Um, this was the first uh, hospital staffed by women. And its purpose was not just to give the poor women of the tenement neighborhoods an opportunity to consult a doctor of their own sex, but also to be a place for the slowly growing numbers of female medical graduates to have a place to get practical training. So those graduates of some of those female medical colleges would come here and become um, resident assistants for the Blackwells. Um, I uh, was privileged to make uh, the acquaintance of the woman who owns this building and who is restoring it lovingly as a center of woman-owned business. Um, she allowed me to actually come in and write some of the book that's about the infirmary in the infirmary, and she was renovating it, and, and it was a chance to see some of the original rafters and the brickwork. Um, this was the second floor. This would have been where one of the hospital wards was, um, the original windows, um, the way the light came in, again, feeling the ghosts nearby, feeling what, um, what the physical reality of your subjects really was. As you might expect, people who, uh, two sisters who founded a hospital in 1857, got involved when civil war broke out just a few years later. In 1861, after Fort Sumter, the Blackwell sisters called a meeting of their own donors and supporters in their own living room and drafted this appeal for the New York Times to the women of New York and especially to those already engaged in preparing against the time of wounds and sickness in the army. There was a lot of chaotic eagerness to help um, the union cause, but not a lot of, um, of organization. And so this appeal invited women to come to a meeting in the Great Hall of Cooper Union, another building that still stands downtown nearby. In response, thousands of women uh, came to this meeting, out of which grew an organization called the Women's Central Association of Relief. And out of that organization grew the U.S. Sanitary Commission. So you can sort of draw a straight line between the Blackwell's Parlor and the most important civilian organization of the Civil War. The Blackwell's found themselves at the head of the committee charged with finding and training young women to go and be nurses at the front. Um, which they, they, they threw themselves into this work. And for, for a minute, it really felt like a validation, a, 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 an evocation of, of Margaret Fuller's dream of men and women as equals, standing shoulder to shoulder in the service of a great cause. Um, and for a minute, the Blackwells were, were really feeling quite fulfilled until it became clear that the male physicians of New York City weren't quite ready to stand shoulder to shoulder with female physicians. Um, they were quite ready to give positions of leadership to women such as Dorothea Dix in Washington who became a leader there, but she had no medical training. She was a lobbyist. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell called her the meddler in chief. Um, and partly because of their extraordinary credentials, the Blackwells found themselves a little bit sidelined. Um, even their hospital was left off the list of hospitals designated for training nurses. Um, and they became dismayed and a little frustrated and eventually withdrew their support from the war effort and turned their attention to their next big project, something of an ironic project. 
um, they decided at last to found their own women's medical college. They had never wanted women to be educated in medicine separately from men. They had thought that their own success, men's medical schools, would have changed that for women, but it didn't. And again, the women's medical colleges that existed were in their minds quite mediocre. So finally they changed their minds, opened their own and made it better than the men's programs they had themselves attended. Their college was three years instead of two. It didn't repeat its courses, it built on them. It had practical training at the bedside. It was altogether a more challenging program. Um, that marked the, the kind of apex of their professional lives together, uh, the founding of the college. Personally, their lives were just as interesting. Um, interest, uh, starting in the 1860s, as I mentioned, the Blackwells became, uh, I think, arguably the first summer residents of Martha's Vineyard. They found property in Chilmark and um, for generations spent time there in the summers. In fact, Emily Blackwell is buried there. Um, both sisters adopted daughters in different ways, another interesting part of the book. Um, Emily Blackwell lived with her uh, domestic partner and fellow surgeon, Elizabeth Cushier, for the last several decades of her life. Two of their brothers, Henry and Sam, married two of the most prominent feminists of the day. That would be Lucy Stone, the suffrage activist, and Antoinette Brown, who was the first woman in this country to be ordained as a minister. To complicate the story further, um, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell did not feel a great degree of sisterhood with these sisters-in-law. They often found themselves out of alignment with the women's rights movement as it emerged. Another interesting and complicated part of this story. Elizabeth and Emily also didn't always agree with each other about the role of women in medicine. Elizabeth, partly because of the loss of her eye, but also because of her natural inclinations, came to see the role of a woman doctor as a teacher armed with science. Um, she pursued public health and moral reform and did a tremendous amount of lecturing and writing and publishing much more so than practice. Emily thought that the role of a woman in medicine was to be as good a practitioner and surgeon and medical professor as the men were, and that's what she was. And so as soon as they had founded their women's medical college, with some relief, the sisters parted ways. And Elizabeth went back to England where she had always wanted to settle and pursued public health and moral reform for the last 40 years of her life. Emily remained in New York and ran the institutions they had founded with great skill and in some ways upheld her sister's legacy as the first woman doctor to the detriment of her own because if we've heard of a Blackwell, it's not Emily anymore. Um, so that's the outline of the story. And I, I think this moment as we both talk of nothing but public health and also celebrate the rise of female leaders at unprecedented levels, it's a good moment for this Blackwell story. Um, this is a picture I like to, I like to close with uh, because of the point it makes. If you Google Elizabeth Blackwell and go to images, you will find this image every time. It, is, um, it, it accompanies articles, I've seen it in documentary films, I've seen it on the jacket of at least one biography of Elizabeth Blackwell. This is a lovely, attractive woman gazing apparently into her own future. Uh, she reminds me a little bit of Jo March from Little Women. This is not a picture of Elizabeth Blackwell. How do I know? Well, it's held in the Museum of the City of New York. And if you flip it over, you can see the ad for the portrait gallery where it was taken, Dana's on 14th Street and 6th Avenue which didn't exist in that spot until the mid 1880s when Elizabeth Blackwell was in her 60s. And no matter how well preserved, this is not a woman in her 60s. The story unfolds right there on the back of the photo. Um, I think this is a, a photo of one of Elizabeth Blackwell's nieces, possibly nicknamed Bessie. Somebody wrote Bessie Blackwell at the top of the back of the photo. Some helpful curator, or at least trying to be helpful, wrote, oh, Bessie Blackwell, Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman doctor of modern times, right. And then someone else down below has written, probably not since Dana's was at the 14th Street address circa 1885. And the museum cataloged this photo as possibly Elizabeth Blackwell, but the proof that it's not is right there. Still, the misidentification persists. Why? Well, this is what we want Elizabeth Blackwell to look like. When we are faced with an array of mostly middle-aged photos and this 
This is the one people pick because people want their heroines to be adorable. They want their heroines to look and feel a certain way. They want them to be likable. And I think it's a really important lesson to learn that heroes aren't always likable, don't always do the admirable thing, are much more complicated than that. Um, the Blackwells were not perky or pretty. They were not interested in pleasing anyone. They had a point to make. They were complicated, prickly, imperfect, and very real heroines, and they changed the world. So it's a good time for their story. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to stop there and unshare, and maybe we can have some questions. Thank you, Janice. That was, that was tremendous. Um, uh, reading this book, and, and you certainly did it in your talk, I always found it, it comes back to the word ironic for me. You know, that, that, that everything, even in your talk and talking about their family, I always found there's irony to them. When you, when you talk about the father, that they make that they make their money in sugar, but he's an abolitionist. Well, you know, as you said, think of that. You know that there's obviously slave labor, and, and that that the sisters are almost painted as suffragettes, and yet they're not. Um, that that they they want to succeed in medicine, but on their own terms. And and I is is that an apt word to say that that, that when you're when you're researching them. I, I, was it ironic to you, or or is there another word that that would uh, summarize them well? Well, I think irony is funny. Irony is sort of a lens, and if you have, you know, most of the people, plenty of people have not heard of the Blackwells. When when you run across someone who has heard of the Blackwells, they generally say, "Oh, I had a book about Elizabeth Blackwell when I was seven. If that is how you have come to their story, then it feels ironic, it feels surprising, startling to, to learn these truths about them because you think of them as sort of pat feminist icons. And of course, if they were feminist icons, then they must have embraced suffrage and they must have aligned with the women's movement and how could they not have? But when you come at them, as I did, um, through their own writing, I, I didn't really read the children's books first. I read their own letters and journals first. And when you do that, when you come at it from that angle, what they sound like is people you know, people who change their minds, contradict themselves, don't always um, take the, the sort of storybook path. Um, so I, I wasn't, I, I, some of the contradictions inherent in their story just felt very real and modern. You know, things like the fact that the Blackwell children in Bristol were horrified by the idea of enslaved labor, were ardent supporters of their father's abolitionism, and as children were, 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 were junior activists and they decided that they weren't going to have sugar in their tea because sugar was attached to slavery. Well, of course, the tea was being paid for by the proceeds of sugar in their family. <laughs> um, that, kind of, that kind of contradiction you know, we, we all live examples of that all day long. Um, that just felt remarkably modern to me and, and a reminder that history is not a, a different time, it's just an older time <laughs> that we were, we're stumbling in the same way. Well put. Um, and, and I also found it interesting too, as, as you described the two of them, you, you used the word that um, Elizabeth selects Emily, you know, that, that, uh, the two, and, but yet, even though they were colleagues and partners, it, it doesn't sound like they were inseparably close. I mean, I guess that happens with siblings all the time, but it, it's, um, you know, I, I keep waiting for that warm fuzzy moment that again, like you end with that picture that though, if you're looking for warm and fuzzy, this isn't the story for you. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, very fair. Um, although they are different from each other enough that they, they serve as foils for each other. Interestingly, there is no photo of them together, which suggest which, which does tell you something about whether about about the degree of warm fuzziness that existed or not. Um, they Elizabeth Elizabeth to start out with was um, a, a, a determined idealist at a level that I have never encountered in my own life. Um, she was a very unusual woman, um, not the kind, not a garden variety type. Emily was more recognizable. She, you know, did suffer from doubt occasionally. 
um, was not quite as rock solid sure of herself as Elizabeth was. Um, and the contra that contrast I found very humanizing to both of them. Um, but it's true, there always was a degree of tension between them, um, which you know played out in the fact that for the last 40 years of their lives, they were on different continents. How successful was their medical school? Once, it, once they created it, how, what did, what did they, what, what did they create from that? <laughs> Quite successful. It, it was rigorous. So it, you know, it, it recruited women of, of high talent, not just anyone. Um, and it lasted until 1899. It, it was opened in 1869 and it, and it was shut down in 1899, not because it had failed, because it had succeeded. Um, it's, its purpose in, in Emily Blackwell's mind, because she was the one who was running it, was to be a place for women to receive a rigorous medical education until such time as they were allowed to go and study alongside men. And in 1899, when Johns Hopkins and Cornell began to admit women, Emily shut the medical college down because she said, our purpose has been served. It is now possible for women to go and study alongside men. The infirmary remained open for more than a century. In fact, it still exists in a, in a sort of a, um, absorbed form in, um, in New York's Lower Manhattan Hospital. Um, but the college was successful enough and, and, and um, really went a long way toward acclimating the public to the idea of accomplished women doctors. Um, quite successfully, enough so that, that, that the, the dream of women being welcomed into men's medical colleges finally was real. What, um, what became of the other siblings? I mean, you mentioned the, the t uh, two of the, the, the brothers, um, but what, what became of the others? Right, so um, down the line, there was, Anna was the first, she was a journalist, um, then Elizabeth and Emily, there was two other daughters. Marion was one of, was the one sibling who didn't have a career. She was sort of the tender of the hearth in their family, the one who um, was kind of the one who looked after mother and, um, and, and kept track of everyone, um, everyone's kind of favorite sister to confide in, but she didn't have a profession. And then the youngest sister, Ellen, was a painter and she studied with people like Rosa Bonheur and um, Ruskin in Europe. This, the, the brothers, um, Howard went into the iron industry in England and then um, went, worked in India and died young. Um, Henry and Sam, I think of as the first feminist husbands because they really um, subordinated themselves to the careers of their wives in a large degree. They, they had careers as businessmen, but smaller. And then the youngest brother, George Washington Blackwell, who had been born in America, um, was quite successful in real estate and, and went a long way toward supporting his, his sister's careers and when they needed some ready cash. Well, you mentioned at the top that um, uh, when their father passed away, it, it showed that they, they didn't need to marry for to, to be successful. Uh, a question here, was Elizabeth allowed to do dissections in her medical school in Geneva, or were dissections used for teaching that? Dissections were both uh, demonstrations where uh, someone called a demonstrator would do a dissection while the class watched. Then there was also dissecting that one did on one's own, um, which at first uh, the faculty at Geneva College, you know, sort of the idea of a woman with her hands in a corpse was too hard for everyone. So they selected the steadiest and most kind of calm of their boy students and created a little tutorial group for her to dissect with um, the first year. And then when it became clear that she could handle it, the second year she was allowed to join the rest of the class in dissections. But it was interesting, um, you know, she, she chose medicine as this rather strategic way to make a point, not because she was particularly interested in the subject, but it was through dissection and through sort of learning the extraordinary architecture of the physical body that she came to really enjoy and appreciate medicine as an intellectual pursuit. She talks about the architecture of the wrist. She was very impressed by. How long did it take you to research this and which, and besides the two sisters, which is obviously the focus of the book, were there characters in there that are um, people in the, in the book that you really, really enjoyed learning about and others that you really, really learned to despise? <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Um... I first, as I said, I first encountered the story in the summer of 2015. 
So, um, and I didn't really get serious about about tackling it for about a year. So I started in earnest in 2016. Um, yeah, I mean, this this book is part of what was daunting about this project is that it spans the old 19th century and the Blackwells were uncannily good at connecting with every famous person you've ever heard of in the 19th century. So this book is full of cameos of much written about people, um, people like Henry Ward Beecher, even Abraham Lincoln, um, Lady Byron, you know, Lucy Stone, of course, um, uh, Florence Nightingale. Um, it was It was really fun to come at these people who, again, you know, are celebrities who you think you know something about, but to come at them through personal letters written before they were famous in some, in many cases. Um, it was really kind of um, a wonderful detective game to, to try and unlearn what you think you know about a certain celebrity and see them as the Blackwell saw them. Um, I really enjoyed that tremendously. And the problem was, of course, that every one of them already does have several books, but I could have, you know, gone down deep rabbit holes enough for several volumes. I have to ask it because you had it in your in your presentation. How exactly did you read the, that cross? Uh, uh, explain that. And how did you read it? And and you, you must be the first person that ever explained it and said they liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I like decoding that you, you um, in the same way that I think you can tune your ear to dialect, you can tune your eye to handwriting. Um, and, you know, after reading all nine siblings, you, you, you know, I, I, I was, I became pretty good at, at, at knowing who I was reading by looking at their handwriting. People are very distinctive. And when it comes to that cross writing, you, you kind of, um, it's sort of hypnotic, but you can you can you can screen out. You can filter your eye filters out the verticals and only sees the horizontals. Um, it, it's kind of hypnotic. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> well, I wanted to thank you for first of all for for doing this tonight, but also for for doing a um, a biography and a portrait of people that was really truthful. You know that, that you didn't make them into heroines. They they didn't wear capes. You know that they, they didn't have an S on their chest that they um, they were flawed, they were determined, but that was also ultimately very successful. So I, I congratulate you on doing that. I mean, that, uh, that, that was a really great portrait of two ladies that don't get a whole lot of ink in, in, the, uh, in textbooks. So uh, congratulations on that. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for joining us tonight. This has been great. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right, and uh, thanks for thanks for being number one hundred on the on the list. <laughs> <laughs> A true honor, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you for doing this. Congratulations on the book. Uh, continued success. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and uh, um, and, and stay safe. Thank you so much. <laughs>